Hello, church. Good to be with you again as we continue our study in the book of Revelation. Boy, I hope you are excited about this as I am. It's a, it's a great study, and we are just moving through here. So I've entitled this, uh, as you all should know by now, a book that you will be blessed by reading, hearing, and taking to heart. And again, I hope that this study, this time, will make sense to you, and this book will be able to be made easy to understand, and uh, it'll stay with you the rest of your life. All right, let's get started today. So I, we've got these handouts that we've been passing out here at uh, the Brown Street Church of Christ, and um, they're on our, if you want to get those and, and print those out, they are on our website. So just go to our website, find that Revelation class and look at all the lessons. And you can print out those uh, uh, handouts that I have. And here's one that we passed out this last week. It's an, actually an outline of Revelation. And I just wanted to kind of go through this. Um, and this is my outline. This is how I understand it, how the kind of break the book up so you can see how we're progressing here. But um, chapters one through five, I, I basically call it the introduction. Um, this is this is God just introducing. Uh, so you've got the general introduction in chapter one where God, uh, you know, addresses who is he writing to, the seven churches of Asia, who's it written, um, or, or who's this coming from. John, he's on the island of Patmos. Why is this being written? Because of the persecution they're going to be going through. And then he introduces both the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. And then, when we get to chapters 2 and 3, God wants those churches to know that I'm with you. And I know you. I know your deeds. I know what you go through. Uh, I want to write an individual letter to all seven of these churches. And I walk among you. And some of those letters are going to be good. Some of them are not going to be so good. And then we get to chapters four and five before we get into the main story of this of this uh, book. He says, now I want you to see really who I am. And he shows that throne room of God in chapters four and five. And that was last week's lesson. Uh, this week will be the seven seals. And that's the storyline that's revealed. Uh, then the book is kind of different. It, it kind of it kind of uh, it, it's written in a different way. It's like. There's seven seals, but then he stops the story and tells the story within the story. And we'll see that hopefully next week. And then he moves to the seven trumpets. These are trumpets of warning, okay? Um, and God always wants to give warning before he brings his judgment. But then he stops and he has another intermission. Uh, this is the story within the story, number two. So that's intermission number two, and then there's intermission number three, and he tells the story again, but he tells it in a different way. It's the story within the story. It's a different way of writing, and you'll see how it all works out. And then we move over here to the seven bowls, and these are the seven bowls of wrath. So you can see that storyline just moving. It's like God is now going to bring his wrath. And then he tells the details of that judgment in chapter 17. This is on Rome. There's Caesars and their false gods. Then we're going to read the obituary. This is of Rome, Caesar, and their false gods. Then we've got chapter 19 because now they've been destroyed because this is who's persecuting the church in, in uh, the seven churches of Asia. So chapter 19 is going to be the hallelujah chapter. All right. And then chapter 20, it's going to, it's going to talk about all the parties involved. Christians, the people that didn't follow, Satan, the Caesars, um, everybody is going to be addressed uh, in this story and, and what their outcome is going to be. And then chapters 21 and 22 is the triumph and the vindication of God's people. And it ends out that way. Now, that's how I see the book. You may see it a little bit different, but that's how I'm breaking it up. So you kind of know where we're going in the story. Today, we are going to look at the storyline. Now, we've had the introduction, and we're moving into chapter 6. And chapter 6, verse 1 says, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. Remember back, remember back in chapters 4 and 5? Right? Here's this, the, the, this, this, this writing, these scrolls, and they were sealed. 
and no one could be found worthy to open those seals. And finally, someone speaks up and says, Jesus is the one. He is worthy because he is triumph. And so that must have something to do with him, the cross, the resurrection. That must, that's what makes him worthy to be able to open up these scrolls. And so here's that lamb. And he is worthy and he's opening up these seven seals and opening up this scroll and this story that is within. And then it says, Then I heard one of the four living creatures, remember the four living creatures that are around the throne, say in a voice like thunder. So this is with authority. This is with might and power. Come, come. Now we're going to see this again and again in this chapter come so this is inviting he wants you to see what's going on now specifically this is probably talking to john come i want you to see this but he's also inviting who these letters are written to the seven churches of asia come and see this but also for all of us so there's the scroll and it's sealed and he opens up that first seal now Remember back in chapter four, verse one, back here in, in this in this throne room picture, when, when you go down here in verse one, it says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And there was the voice of the first I had first heard speaking to me like a trumpet saying, come. So again, inviting come and I will show you must, what must take place after this. So this is what's happening. This is what's going to happen in the future. And we're going to see that this is not long to the future. It is short to the future in the lifetime of the seven churches of Asia. Because that's who it's written to. And that's called staying with context. So there's those four living creatures. Remember? Remember last week we talked about them and how it connected to the cherubim in the book of Ezekiel. Angels. There's a connection between these. And what we're going to see when we go through this book is we're going to see that here's the seven seals. That's chapter six. That's going to roll into the seven trumpets. That's the seven trumpets of warnings. That's chapters eight and nine. And then here comes the wrath. Here comes the judgment. The seven bowls. That's chapter 15 and 16. Okay. Seven, seven, and seven. So here we go. Here's seal number one. And we're going to focus on four horses here. With four of these seals, it's going to connect to a horse. Each horse is going to have a different color. And again, when we look at this book, colors have meanings. Numbers have meanings. It's figurative. It's not literal. Just step back and get the picture of what's going on here. So here's number one. Verse two. I looked, and there before me was a white horse. Its rider held a bow, and he was given a crown, and he rode out as a conqueror, bent on conquest. And the question is, who is the rider, and why is he on a white horse? Well, if you look at this, this is a victor's crown, okay? A white horse, a bow, and he conquers. The only other time that we see somebody riding on a white horse in the book of Revelation is Jesus. And we see this in chapter 19. So I'm going to connect this to Jesus. And what does he do? He conquers. And that's exactly what he did. That's what it was said back in chapters 4 and 5. He overcame. He triumphed. How did he triumph? By the cross. He was sinless every single day. He overcame. And because of that, and because of his death and his burial and his resurrection, that, that perfect lamb, without sin, without blemish, he holds the keys of death and Hades in his hand. And so by doing that, he conquers. So here's, on, here's, this, here's Jesus, and this is what I believe is Jesus here. He's riding and he conquers. This is a war horse, but he's victorious. Now, what's going on here? <laughs> well. This is how I understand it. He's telling us 
it's almost like you jump to the end of the book. Have you ever done that? Have you ever started reading a book and you wanted to jump to the very end and see what happened? <laughs> well, that's exactly what's happening. I want to tell you the story. Here's the story about the seven churches of Asia. Here's what's going to happen to them. But let me jump all the way to the end of the book and tell you what's going to happen. Jesus is going to conquer. He's going to win. So right off the bat, everything's going to be okay. And we need to understand that. We need to understand that as a church, no matter what happens to us, if we are in Christ, if we die, we get cancer, we get hit by a car, we are persecuted and stuck in prison, we're okay. Because who? Because Jesus conquers. All right? That's how I understand this. You read it. You see what you think. Here's seal number two. Now here's where things get tough. When the Lamb opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, so these living creatures, remember, they're, they're involved here with these seals. He says, I heard the second living creature say, come. So this is inviting. I want you to see this. A fiery red one. Okay, I'm sorry. Then another horse came out, a fiery red one. So now we have a red horse. Okay? We had a white horse. Now we have a red horse. And its rider was given what? Power. To take peace from the earth and to make men slay each other. To him was given a large sword. Now see, here's the storyline where we don't like this so much. Okay? But watch what happens here. This rider was given power. Who is the only one that gives power in, the, in this earth, in this universe? It's God. So God is allowing this to happen. That means he's in control of this. But watch what's happening. He's given power to take peace from the earth. And i got to let you know, peace has been taken from this earth, hasn't it? Right? Satan is the ruler of this earth. He has lots of people following him. It is a fallen world. We don't like that. We don't like even thinking that way. We want to think that everything is fine, but I'm here to tell you, it's not. It never has been, and it never will be until we get out of this earth. So this is part of the storyline. He's given power and to slay each other. And to him was given a large sword. And remember, Again, this is connected to those four creatures. And it's connected to cherubim. And remember what cherubim did. They guarded God's righteousness. So this is a war horse, a red horse, and it takes away peace. There's the next horse. Here's seal number three. I don't think you're going to like this one either. When the lamb opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. Again, you got to see this. I looked, and there before me was a black horse, and its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. Now, you just picture this. He's got scales in his hand. Okay? Then I heard what sounded like a voice among the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a day's wages, and three quarts of barley for a day's wages. But do not damage the oil and the wine. Okay? Now, what we see here, when we saw last week, and we looked at that Old Testament picture, these four creatures that are surrounding the throne room of God, okay? And we've seen the connection with Ezekiel chapter 1, that this is God's war horse. They've got eyes all around them. And this is like God's throne, and it's moving, right? But it was a flame, it was on fire. And then that chapter connected us to Ezekiel chapter 10, which pointed us to what? That this is God's defenders of righteousness, these cherubim, these angels. These are, these are God's mighty uh, warriors of angels. And that's interesting. Now, all that is connected here. And he is allowing these tough things to happen. And what is this pointing to? This is pointing to famine. 
This is pointing to scales, weighing out food. This isn't a pretty picture, is it? It's not a pretty picture at all. But when we went through Daniel, we saw this before. Give me a minute, and we're going to look at some verses there. What is going on here? Well, let's keep going. Then we come to seal number four. And we get to verses seven and eight. When the lamb opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, come. Okay. Again, you want to see this. There they are again. Now the fourth living creature. Right. Connected to cherubim. Might, God's mighty, you know, warriors here. I looked and there before me was a pale horse. Its rider's rider was named what? Death. Death. And Hades was following close behind them. And they were given power. Wait a minute. Where does power come from? From God. So that means that God is in ultimate control of this. They were given power over the fourth of the earth to kill by sword famine and plague and by the wild beast of the earth is that a pretty picture it's not a pretty picture not at all so this this rider is death he's on a pale horse so you've got war you've got famine and you've got death this is part of the storyline now we get to seal number five Watch the story progress. When he opened the fifth seal, watch what he sees. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. And they cried out in a loud voice. Who are these people? These people are Christians who have died. What did we just see with the last horses? War, famine, and death. Now we're looking at some people who have died. Are these the people that died as a result of the war, the famine, and the death? I think so. It's the story continuing. And who are these people? Christians. And who's in control of this? God. You mean that God would allow Christians to be killed by war, famine, and death? Apparently. Let's keep going. So here they are, and they are under the under the altar. And remember, I've told you this is a it's an Old Testament book, right? So when you go back to the Old Testament and you follow the tabernacle, and then it turns into the the, the 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 temple right there are two altars one sits outside in the courtyard and this is the altar of burnt offerings now could they be pictured as being under this well just just picture this just think of this here here's animals being sacrificed on this here's fire coming down and coals are falling down the fat of the animals are hitting those coals and it is dripping down now, if I was up underneath that, what would that be pictured as? What were those animals sacrificed for? Forgiveness. The blood for forgiveness. So, in that sense, if I'm on, up underneath that altar, I am being showered with forgiveness, which, which ultimately points to the Lamb of God who died on the cross, right? That could be the picture here. The other picture is, here's the other altar, and the, this is the altar of incense. Now, once you go inside of the tent of meeting, and you get inside here, just before the curtain, you find the altar of incense. Now, what does this represent? If this is the altar that it's talking about, why did the smoke go up? Why did the priest go in there and offer up incense to God? It was the prayer of the saints. Okay? He's going in and doing a vicarious act of worship on behalf of the Israelites who are outside. And he's taking that smoke 
and waving it before God, burning that incense. And what is he doing? He's reminding God to keep his promises. So here's these saints underneath this altar. Now, which altar was it? Was it the altar of burnt offerings that they were under, or was it the altar of incense? I think in the context, it fits a little bit better of this one because of what is mentioned next. I believe it's the altar of incense. Now, just get the picture. It says, how long? They have a question. Okay, they've been killed. They are now up under the altar of God. Remember, this is just a picture. This is a picture for us to gain from, right? Seven churches of ages, same thing to gain from this. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth and avenge our blood? Those Christians are down there dying. We've already died. There's more that's going to die. How long before you avenge our blood? Verse 11. Then each of them was given a white robe. They were told to wait, what? A little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers who were to be killed, wait a minute, as they had been, was completed. Now, do you like this? Do you like the story? <laughs> and we go, no, I don't like that story. I don't want that story played out in my life or any other Christian or any other time in history. You don't like that story. But as much as you don't like it, that's the world we live in. That's what goes on down here. There is a battle going on. It's con a continual battle. But remember, the first horse was Jesus, and he conquers. Don't forget that. That's why he told you that at the very beginning. Because there's some tough things going to happen, isn't there? And this has happened so many times in history. It's happening again with the seven churches of Asia. Now remember back in Daniel? Daniel is going to point to this. Okay? Remember in Daniel chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 7, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream in chapter 2. There's the statue. There was four kingdoms. The last kingdom was Rome. And then Daniel has a dream, four beasts. And that's in chapter 7. And that last beast is Rome. Remember what it says? Let's go back. Daniel 7.25. He will speak against the Most High. This is a Roman Caesar. This is one of the kings that come from that, that fourth kingdom, right? And he will oppress the saints. Well, that's what's happening in Revelation, isn't it? And try to change the set times and laws. The saints will be handed over to him for a time, times, and half a time. They're going to be persecuted. They're going to be handed over to this guy. Okay? Nobody likes that story, do we? No. And that's what these Christians are asking. How long? Well, let's see. But the courts will sit. And his power will be taken away and completely destroyed for how long? forever. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of the kingdoms under the whole earth will be handed over to who? To the saints. Right? We read that before, that the saints will reign here on earth. It's in Revelation. Not literally, but we reign because we're with Christ. And we need to understand that. The people of the Most High, his kingdom will be an everlasting kingdom, and all the rulers will worship and obey him. That's the same story. Revelation 7 is, or I'm sorry, Daniel 7 is pointing to Revelation, the book of Revelation. See how that fit? Yeah, okay. Pretty cool, ain't it? Pretty cool. All right, so they're asking how long. Here's seal number six. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. Okay, here it comes. Ground shaking. And the sun turned black like sackcloth made of goat hair. And the moon turned blood red. And the stars of the sky fell to earth. As late figs drop from a tree when... Um, Get rid of my picture here. When shaken 
by a strong wind. What's going on here? Well, just curious. There's Jesus opening up those seals, right? Moon turning blood red. Stars falling from the sky. And what does our religious friend say? This is the end of time. That's what this is pointing to. Wait a minute. Stay with context. Context. Stars falling out of the sky, right? The sky receded like a scroll rolling up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. There it is. It's got to be those pictures of the end of time. You know how many people make lots and lots of money on the book of Revelation, scaring people like, oh man, this is going to happen to the future and all this stuff is going to happen stars are going to fall out of the sky yep see there it is united states and, you know statue of liberty and it's just all falling apart people make a lot of money on this but the question is is that what this is talking about well we're going to see then the kings of the earth the princes the generals the rich the mighty and every slave and every free man hid in caves and among the rocks of the mountains. Oh, James, that's the end of time, right? See, there it is, falling from the sky. Everybody's scared, and they go run and hide, and they're going to hide in these caves. That's the end of time, end of time judgment. They call to the mountains and the rocks, fall on us. And hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And from the what? The wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come. And the question is, who can stand? Who can stand? So this is the great wrath, the, the, the great day of their wrath. But again, who is this wrath coming on? It's coming on the enemies of the seven churches of Asia. And who would that be in the context? Rome, their Caesars, and their false gods. That's context. Now, if you leave that context, and you can start applying this to anybody and everybody, um, as our world has done over the many decades. But I want you to think about this. I know this is kind of a blurry picture, but the wrath of the Lamb. I mean, on one side, you've got a picture of a lamb, which is nice and calm, and you pet it. It's, it's nice. And then on the other side, you've got this fierce lion. The wrath of the lamb? Is this where this is coming from? Is this our Jesus that we serve? Who died on the cross? Does he have this power? He does. There's another side to him. And if you're on the wrong side of him, you better watch out. And that includes Rome. So, just to take all these verses that we just read and to show you that this is not the end of time, let's go back and look at some and see if you don't see some similarities here. We're going to go to Isaiah chapter 13. And in the context, this is judgment against Babylon. In time judgment. Watch this. See if this doesn't sound familiar. Verse 6. Well, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come like destruction from the Almighty. Because of this, all hands will go limp. Every man's heart will melt. Terror will seize them. Pain and anguish will grip them. They will uh, writhe like a woman in labor. They will look uh, aghast at each other like faces aflame. See, the day of the Lord is coming, a cruel day with wrath and fierce anger to make the land desolate, to destroy the sinners within. Watch this. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their sins. What is this talking about? The context? This is judgment against Babylon. Not end time judgment. Let's keep going. Let's go over here to Isaiah 34. 
Isaiah 34. See, this doesn't sound something like we read here in Revelation. Verses 2 through 6. The Lord is angry with all nations. His wrath is upon their armies. He will totally destroy them. He will give them over to slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out. Their dead bodies will send up a stench. The mountains will be soaked with their blood. The stars of heaven will be dissolved. The sky will be rolled up like a scroll. Man, it sounds just like Revelation, doesn't it? All the starry hosts will fall like withered leaves from the vine, like sh uh, shriveled figs from the fig tree. Sounds real familiar, doesn't it? Again, this is against the nation of Edom and all nations in the context. That's end time judgment. Let's go over here to Jeremiah. So you go to Isaiah and you go to Jeremiah in the next book, chapter 4, verse 23 through 25. I looked at the earth and it was formless and empty and at the heavens and their light was gone. I looked at the mountains and they were quaking and the hills were swaying. I looked and there were no people. Every bird in the sky had flown away. I looked and the fruitful land was a desert and its towns lay in ruin before the Lord, before his fierce anger. This was judgment against Judah, which Daniel got hauled away into slavery. That's why he was over in Babylon. This is Jeremiah prophesying this judgment that God is bringing on a nation of his people. Would God do that? Is this end time judgment or end time judgment? It's end time. You'll see the same wording in Amos chapter 4 verse 13 against Israel, the northern tribe. And you will see this again in Micah. Let's go over to Micah. This is in your minor prophets. You're going to pass Daniel, Hosea, and Amos. Here's Micah, and you're going to go to chapter 1, verse 3. Look, the Lord is coming from his dwelling place. He comes down and treads the high places of the earth. The mountains melt beneath him, and the valleys split apart, like wax before the fig, or the fire, uh, like water rushing down a slope. All this is because of Jacob's transgressions, because of the sins of the house of Israel. What is Jacob's transgression? Is it not Samaria? What is Judah's high place? Is it not Jerusalem? Again, this is judgment coming down on Samaria and Jerusalem in time. And the Assyrians are going to come down and destroy them. That's not end of time. That's end time. And the wording sounds exactly like the wording in Revelation. So here we are in Revelation. We're trying to look at the context and saying, is this talking about the end of time? Or is this talking about end time? Hmm. Stretching your mind a little bit, isn't it? And you will also see this in Zephaniah chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. And this is judgment on Judah and Jerusalem. See, now what we're doing is here is we're letting the Bible interpret the Bible. Okay? And so instead of reading this inside of itself in Revelation, and just going, oh, this has got to be about the end of time. Let's see if God hasn't used this same kind of wording in other places. And then put it in context and apply that to Revelation. So, this is all end time judgment. So, is this talking about the end of time? No. It's not the context. It doesn't fit. But yeah, most of our world reads this book and says it is. Now. We were left with another question. When God does bring this judgment, and in the context, this is going to be on Rome, and those that are persecuting the seven churches of Asia, he asks this question, who can stand? Who can stand? Well, this same wording is found over in the book of Micah, or Malachi. And I want you to see what it says in Malachi. Now, Malachi is written just before Jesus comes. These are the last words of the Old Testament. And the next thing that's going to happen is Jesus is going to come. Okay? In fact, let's turn over there. Let me read to you, to you the first couple verses of this chapter. Let's 
So go to Matthew and then hang a left. And you will come to the book of Malachi. Look at chapter 3, verse 1. See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. This is John the Baptist, right? He's going to prepare the way for Jesus. Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. This is Jesus. They've been seeking him all through the Old Testament. Send that Savior. Send that Messiah. Come and help us, God. The messenger of the covenant. He will bring a covenant, won't he? He will complete the covenant package, right? Whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But then it asks this question. But who can endure the day of his coming? When he arrives, who is going to be able to stand when he appears? It's the same question that, that uh, Revelation is asking. Who can stand when this judgment is being brought down in, the, in, in time on Rome or the many other times that God had done this with other nations? Who can stand? Well, let's see how a person can stand and who those people can be. For he will be like a refiner's fire and a launderer's soap. So when he gets here, that's what he's going to do. And you think about a refiner's fire. What does a fire do? To put, put that gold in there and it takes out all the impurities. Okay, That's what God's trying to do with this world. He's trying to clean us up and take those impurities out. Okay. Unfortunately, a lot of the world doesn't do that. They don't allow God to do that. And they shake their fist at him and say, no, I'm going to live the way that I want to live. And then it also says he's going to be a purifier of silver. Now watch who he purifies. And this is, this is interesting here. He will purify the Levites and refine them like gold and silver. Now here's my question to you. Why did he just point to the Levites here in the book of Malachi? What are the Levites? Well, they're the scribes. They're the teachers of the law. They are the people that go to the temple, burn the incense, got to go behind the uh, curtain, the Holy of Holies, right? The high priest. These are men. These are the leadership, the spiritual leadership of Israel. So who does God start with? He starts with the top. He starts with the very top. He doesn't start with prostitutes, and tax collectors, or whoever else is at the bottom here. He goes right for the top. I want to know who's going to be able to stand. And here's how you're going to stand. Leaders of Israel, you're going to have to be purified. You're going to have to be cleaned up. You're going to have to be washed up. Now, once that happens and you become refined, God, you allow God to take those impurities out. Watch what happens. Then the Lord will have men who will bring offerings in righteousness. Finally, God will have what he needs from mankind. And the offerings of Judah and Jerusalem will be acceptable to the Lord as in days gone by, as in former years. Revelation is asking who can stand. And Malachi is asking who can stand. And who is that? It's only those that allow themselves to be refined by God. Those are the only ones that will see God and see Jesus as who they are. But the others that are filled with pride and arrogance. God's people are not God's people. They will never bring offerings in righteousness because they were not refined by God. So, we want to make sure that when this book is being presented here, this book of Revelation, and we see the storyline, that we are always on the right side of God. That we do not leave him, that we are not apart from him, that we remain with him. And if we do, then we will, be con we will conquer. But if we don't, and we give into this world and follow the world, then we will not. And we will be with the rest of those people, as in the book of Revelation.
I hope this is helping. This is a powerful book. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here. But we have just had the storyline. That's the story. And that story is going to be played out through the rest of the book of Revelation. Now you know it. Now let's go and look at all the details that are given as it's presented. What a book. What an amazing book. God bless you, church. And I hope we will see you next time as we continue our study in Revelation.